In an ancient holy city, deep in the West Bank of Palestine, I found myself witnessing a parade of Israeli settlers, escorted by dozens of armed soldiers. This so-called settler tour, which had crossed into a Palestinian neighborhood in the segregated city of Hebron, suddenly brought the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into direct view. This is not what they wanted me to see on my birthright trip. Where do I stand in this situation? With my people reclaiming their lost holy land? Or with the Palestinians looking on as their home is slowly taken by an occupying force? Birthright has an explicitly right wing bond that connects us all to one another. This is the greatest right thing that the Glee does. It's a discovery. Today we reaffirm the unbreakable bond of friendship between Israel citizens and the United States. Good morning, KBOO listeners. You're listening to One Land, Many Voices on KBOO Portland. My name is Layla Kanan, and on today's show, I interview filmmaker and creative storyteller Ben Grazel. Ben has an upcoming project he's working on about American Jewish identity and its connection to Israel, and I thought that he could provide a different perspective on the show. Here's Ben with us at KBOO. Thanks for coming, Ben. Yeah, thank you for having me, Layla. Um, so just give us a little bit of background, who you are, where you grew up, what you, what your religion is, what you identify as. Right, so I grew up right here in Portland. I was raised Jewish, and I had a bar mitzvah, and I still identify as Jewish, but the religious aspects are certainly not a part of my life, and the ethno-religious identity is not a significant part of my identity mm-hmm. at this point either. I went to Hebrew school once a week, and we'd have Shabbat dinner, celebrate the major holidays. But other than that, you know, I really feel like if I was to just like describe my identity to someone, I would say I'm a filmmaker. I am a student. I like to go outside, and I, I don't think that uh, when I think about who I am, my Jewishness comes first. Mm. But I think it's interesting because this is what Birthright, for instance, and a lot of these programs are really concerned with is people like me who their Jewish identity isn't a significant part of their life and that's really threatening to a lot of people. Right. So speaking of birthright, can you tell us about the upcoming project that you're working on? Yeah, so uh, advertisement came up on my Facebook page for an organization called Birthright Hmm. and they were saying you should come on this free trip to Israel and I was thinking about it. I'm like that could be a really interesting documentary project to make like I have this kind of complicated relationship with my Jewish identity and to the state of Israel and it could be really interesting to explore that through a film project for a month and see what happens. So what are you expecting to get out of it? Ta-da! <laughs> you are so sweet and funny. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. Oh, honey bunch. Good to see you. Didn't expect that. That's what's called an ambush, I think. Right? Now, I need to pull out some chocolates for you. Big selection, here, (laughs) help yourself. (laughs) Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. Very quickly, the orders that were issued that limited Jewish people's civil rights and freedom to move, destroyed the dignity of people with the abuse that was heaped on us exposed many to death by shooting or beating. It all started very soon and uh, ended up in us being herded into a ghetto where conditions deteriorated even further. Uh, Hunger, cold. Most of my family was sent off to a killing camp called Treblinka. My grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, 
and extended family as well. At one point, uh, the children were all gathered up and sent to their death, uh, including my four-year-old sister, Dorka. Then my father was sent away. We didn't know where or whether we'd ever see him again. And then eventually, my mother and I were sent to Auschwitz, which I suppose people know that it's really the epitome of all horrible extermination camps. And we managed to survive there for seven months, which is practically unheard of. And then we were um, liberated by the Russian army. When we came into Auschwitz, I was tattooed at the end of the processing. Sometimes I catch myself now getting a glimpse of it, and there it is still. So it's really part of me now. We knew that we had to leave Poland because there was no future for Jewish people there that we could see. All our relatives practically had been murdered there. Our uh, town, our community was wiped out completely. It was just too difficult to stay there. And uh, I began to learn about uh, Zionism. I was very enthused about the idea of a Jewish homeland, especially having just gone through this horrible destruction of the majority of our people in Poland and Europe in general. And none of the countries had stepped up to protect the Jewish populations in those places. And that was very painful. And it convinced me, it made me realize that we needed to have our own homeland, our own country. So I became an ardent Zionist. And I really wanted to go to Palestine and help set up a Jewish state. My parents, they made a very interesting suggestion. They said, well, we've applied to go to Palestine, and whichever visas come first, that's where we'll go. Our American visas came up, and we were processed for immigration to the United States. But it's just so interesting to think that, like, that family lineage could have, like, it wouldn't be me, obviously, but me as the, the, the grandson of my grandmother would be living in Israel right now. Right. You know, it could right. have happened so easily. I've never been to the area, so I don't want to make any claims about what it's like there until mm -hmm. I go. But right. I'm really curious to see how these narratives about Israel I've heard. I guess one extreme narrative being that, like, the whole state of Israel is a settler, colonial, imperialist organization that's inherently you know, evil and genocidal. Mm -hmm. And then one being that Israel is a peaceful, democratic, liberal nation that's just trying to live in peace, but its neighbors are just too unfriendly and they have to defend themselves. Right. So I'm curious to go to all these places and talk to people and see what do I actually think? Birthright has a strict policy against any filming during an official tour. Therefore, all the filming for this project was done outside of my actual birthright trip. But here's what happened. We landed in Israel to our birthright guide welcoming us home. We went out clubbing in the vibrant city of Tel Aviv. We visited the Western Wall and the Kotel, the holiest site in Judaism. We traveled the tiny country from north to south, learning about the history of this land and its importance to our people. It was a powerful and moving experience, but most of all, it was really fun. So, I just got off birthright, off Taglit, as they call it here in Israel, and I was so critical going in. I thought it would be absolute propaganda and there was propaganda, or I don't want to say propaganda, but it, was, it wasn't a fair representation of the land. And I was conscious of it the whole time. 
But somehow I still feel more in touch with my Jewish identity. I feel more connected to this land and I tend to sympathize with Israel more than I did before the trip. Yeah, I just, a lot of my friends who have done Birthright have talked about how much propaganda there is. Like, they'll take them to the graveyards of IDF soldiers and they'll, you know, tell them to look at all the fallen soldiers that have been killed by Palestinians. And Birthright just seems like such a, um, such a one-sided thing to me. The way that Birthright is set up, it tends to make, from what I've seen at least, it tends to make people fall in love with the state. And maybe it is intentional, but why wouldn't it be if you're sending five to $5,000, $6,000 for a participant to go, you would hope that they would fall in love with the, with the country. But I don't think it's like any type of like malicious agenda of any sort. Birthright is a life-changing experience. And I, uh, I hope you can um, testify to that uh, for yourself. You can live in Israel, you can live in the States, you can live in Egypt, you can live in, in Ethiopia. You still belong here because this is your Jewish homeland. All of who we are coming from this land, all of our identity coming from here, all of the, um, the, the question and the struggle that we are facing until today coming from this land. And Birthright was established to give every Jewish person the um, ability and the chance to make the journey to his identity, to explore his identity. I mean, there is no agenda that, um, but to explore of the Jewish identity. The Jewish life is about Tikkun Olam. So we have to bring the ultimate goodness of God into the reality. How do you do it? That's the idea of Tikkun Olam, to make the world a better place. And the State of Israel, when the State of Israel was born, that's one of the main goals of Tikkun Olam. We get to Israel, everyone is already excited just because it's a new experience, you're meeting new people, you're getting to a new place. And the first couple days, it was all about having good times and good vibes, um, nothing really politically or religious or anything. And then after that came this period of sort of the, the gravity and weight of what is happening in Israel from a very Israeli standpoint and what has happened to Jews sort of sets in and we have this jam-packed tragic day of going to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, and going to Mount Herzl to um, this Israeli memorial where we have these Israeli guides and soldiers that we as birthright participants have just become close with and you hear their very moving stories, which they are very moving and valid and sad about either things that they've experienced or witnessed or friends that they have lost. After that, I felt more of a heavy recruitment to come to Israel. And then at the end of our trip, it was just like riding that roller coaster back up. Um, and it was just like fun, fun, fun. It's 10 days of like this emotional roller coaster, sleep deprived journey of just like powerful experience, um, which I think is all well manicured to make American Jews or other Jews from around the world have this bond with Israel. I grew up in a very reformed household. I went to Jewish day school and everything, but it was just something I did. It wasn't something that was like necessarily meaningful to me. And then as I got older, I decided that birthright was something I wanted to do because personally I love traveling. And um, this was kind of just a reason to travel somewhere else. And then, you know, it's a free trip essentially. So why not take advantage of it? I went into the trip expecting a fun time, free trip, you know, ma making some friends, but when I got to Israel, it was like something just like clicked. Literally two weeks after I got back, I knew I had to go back, so I applied to staff Birthright. Birthright works. You know, people go on the trip, people like me. 
I'm a birthright participant who came into it looking for a free trip and ended up falling in love and staffing it. And I think that that's a small success story. But then you see people who move to Israel. You see people who make Aliyah. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm Ben's cousin. I live here in Jerusalem. I've lived here for about four years. Um, I'm from the States originally, and I'm living here now. I came to Israel as a tourist. I came on Taglit five or so years ago, and after the trip was over, I decided to travel around by myself for a couple of weeks. And while I was there, I asked someone for directions. And the long story short is I asked him for directions and he asked me out. And when I finished school, I decided to come back here and he and I stayed together. And now here we are four years later and we're still together, so. On my first day off of Birthright, I took the bus across town to meet up with my grandmother's friend, Naomi. This is my granddaughter, Sharon and her husband John, it's a wedding. They met in Taglit, in Israel, and five years later they got married, and he finished school and she finished school, and now they have a little girl, and they are very, very happily married. <laughs> so Taglit works, huh? Taglit works, definitely. It's a wonderful uh, program. She was so happy, she came the second time as a leader, and she recruited close to 20 students to come and participate in Taglit. To me, Naomi represents the Israeli counterpart to my diaspora grandmother, having immigrated to Palestine as a child before the Holocaust and before the establishment of the State of Israel. What does Herzl represent to you? It's a Zionist movement. He was a founder. Because of him, we live here in Israel and we were saved because all my mother's relatives were taken to Auschwitz. My grandparents, my uncles and aunts and cousins. We are the only one that came here to live here. And people that tell me how bad Israel is and how much they are against Israel and so forth, I realize that they actually really hate Jews, but they don't want to say it because it's not in to say it. Then they say how Israel, you in Israel, do things well, they're not supposed to do. Yes, people say Yes, but I believe that your generation sees that, you know, if you don't support the Israeli policy, you're against Israel, you're anti-Semitist, and so on. And I, I don't believe it, you and know. And rockets from Gaza to, to, to the Jewish settlements around Gaza area. They will only talk about the Israeli airplanes that bombed Gaza, but not why they bombed Gaza. But do we tell ourselves, and we, do we tell the Americans, the, our, you know, our American brothers, Jewish brothers, why the, the Arabs in Gaza bombed us from the first place because they are desperate. They have no, they they have no hope. They have no signal of hope. But where are their leaders? Hmm? They get so much money from all over the world, and they build those tunnels. Right, no legitimacy to violence. I agree with you, but we control their life. We control the electricity. We control the water supplement. We control the medical we supplement. Are them all this. Let's face it. Israel is the stronger side, much stronger side. When, when the Palestinians bomb us, they get it back. <laughs> and Israeli officials celebrate the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem the at the same time in Gaza, the violent reaction. God bless Jerusalem, that the eternal, undivided capital of Israel. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, shechianu vekeimanu. You want to take a picture of my gun? No, where is it? 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 and an Israeli birthright tour facilitator, I decided to pull out my camera when the conversation took a political turn. For us as Israelis, we always call it a neighborhood inside of the jungle. This is what is Israel. 
we all around within the Middle East. You mean? Yeah, because okay. all around we are not don't have democracy. I mean, Egypt is not really democracy. Uh, Jordan the same. Assyria it's all broken. Lebanon it's not con it's controlled by Hezbollah. Uh, Iran is totalitarian uh, regime, and Saudi Arabia it's uh, it's like a kingdom. So all of us, it's, I mean, we are a democracy inside the jungle. In Israel, we don't have the option to fail, because if we will fail, we will die. No, so, so you're kind of saying it's about the uncertainty, like you already know that we are electing Jewish. Netanyahu isn't going to lead we, to the destruction of, of Israel. Us. Like Israel is surviving under Netanyahu, so I we can, don't want to lead to the uncertainty. I can promise you one thing as a Jewish. You are Jewish, leader. okay? We are, I, I, it's, it's, so it could sound bad, especially in a videotape. <laughs> Jewish. And I say it about myself. To be a Jew for me, it's all—it's like a rat. It's always to find or to think about a, the way to escape from some catastrophe who can happen in your life. It's a way of life. Because this is the Jewish way. We don't have any other option because we know that if we're going to be weak, then someone will kill us. This is the mess. This is the... It's ex... It's, it's uh, equal to Y, I don't know. It's, if you'll be weak, you can die, you will be die. I wonder what you think about the fact that anti-Semitic hate crimes have risen significantly in America since Trump's election. Whoa. I mean, you can talk about correlation Irish versus Irish causation, Irish. causation there and everything, but, but yeah, Trump. that's a fact. It's not because of him. No, but it's, it Again, falls I mean, under... You want to say he is... Uh, faith. Well, because He's we disagree or we can agree to accept each other's opinions and learn from them. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so glad I to be grown. a Jew who's visiting Israel yeah. right now. I'm glad you Regardless of whether I agree with, you know, Anyone. Israeli politics or anything. Yeah. I came on the uh, LGBT trip. In general, in my experience, I would say it was a lot more balanced and less like super nationalistic like go Israel than I thought it would be. I thought it would be like a lot of propaganda sort of that I'd have to like, you know, sort through on my own. But I feel like our tour guide did, did a very good job of presenting the nuances of more issues. The most negative part of my birthright experience was the uh, mega event. So it was thousands and thousands of people all on birthright trips from all around the world. It was basically like kind of a giant like concert party sort of thing, but with a very, very like pro-Israel agenda. It was very nationalistic, very much not the kind of nuanced perspective that I had been getting from the rest of my trip. And I, I left that event feeling more uncomfortable, like, with being a Zionist. It's also a tension within me thinking about having a Jewish state. Does that imply Jewish supremacy? Is that the equivalent of white nationalism? I think that's what made me so uncomfortable about the Birthright Mega event, is that it really did feel more nationalist and more like, you know, we're Jews, this is our country. Whereas seeing this as a state that is explicitly a safe haven for Jews who have not had that sort of place throughout history. To have a Jewish state is important. Um, to have a homeland is important. I feel like most cultures have a place that they can call home. Um, and that brings a sense of security to a people. Um, the Holocaust wasn't that long ago. And even now, we have Muslims in concentration camps. And this idea of eugenics, of making a pure race, is not in the past. These things aren't gone. Like, how are we going to be safe? That's a big issue. We begin in France, where a surge in anti-Semitic violence and of hate speech has... percent of anti-religious anti-Semitic incidents, a 57 percent spike. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in America, spiking dramatically over just the last two years. I don't like, personally, I don't like the linkage. Anti-Semitic in the states of Israel, it's something that I don't like because we're here because this is our homeland. And yes, this is a safe place to the Jewish people, but a safe place, it's like a by side to, uh, to the idea of the states of Israel and our connection to this land. The dream of coming to the uh, states of Israel didn't start from 1917 in the Balfour Declaration. Every Passover, 
when you're doing the ceremony and you remember and you mention the, um, the time that uh, you made the exodus from, uh, from Egypt, the last paragraph is, next year in Jerusalem. The idea of dreaming of Jerusalem and coming to the homeland and was always there. So you don't have to support the states of Israel. You don't have to speak Hebrew. You don't have to be Zionist. But you always have to be a spot because um, it's your home. It's as much as it's mine. After 20 days in Israel, 10 on Taglit and 10 on my own, I was feeling more connected to the idea of Zion than ever before. But I also felt that something was missing. Something was being left out of the frame. I was ready to see the other side. I was told in Israel that the West Bank was extremely dangerous for Jews, an Islamist jungle filled with terrorists that wanted to kill me simply because of my ethnic background. After I had crossed through the checkpoint to the other side of the wall, the physical fault line in a grand clash of civilizations, I felt scared and vulnerable. That is, until I spoke to someone. The very first person I approached asking for directions happened to be an English-speaking student who, upon learning about my project, took me out for dinner and gave me a tour of his home city of Ramallah. Me and my friend, we saw you as a Jew who was trying to find the truth, and we were actually excited, not like scared or threatened or tried to threaten you. We were excited to show you our side of the story, and I think every Palestinian, if they saw somebody from the birthright, they would for sure try to talk to them and like tell them their story. All throughout the West Bank, I found the same story again and again. The reason I am in this part of the world, in Israel, is because I actually came on birthright, and I'm an American Jew. Yeah, I didn't know that before, but okay. Yeah, there's no problem with being Jew. Like I said, it's not about religion. Friends with, you know, Jewish people. I I wanna like just say th something about like it's it's not about Jewish people. They're still humans. Like you cannot <laughs> like hate them or like or not be in friend with them. Yeah. So I'm actually Jewish too. So this is cool. Like I, as I told you, like uh, it's, it's not about like being Jewish or something. It's, it's about like what what you fighting for. One of my friends that uh, I gave tours to Bethlehem area, where we're, I took him to the refugee camp, the wall, the separation wall, and uh, Banks' hotel. After that, I decided to invite him for Kinefe. And I saw him really afraid and shaking. He said, what's wrong? He said, Danny, I want to tell you something. He said, what? Say, I'm a Jew. Say, uh, I said, wow, this is great. I'm so happy to be able to take you on this tour. And then uh, I told him, no, in fact, I would love to see people and meet people like you and take them to the same tour so they will understand the conflict. Many people on the other side and people from the West uh, do not understand the reality of occupation in terms of uh, checkpoints, in terms of the wall, as we are approaching the wall actually right now. So we'll have some time to park and to walk beside the wall and to see some graffiti. This is the tear gas canisters that Israel use. In fact, uh, uh, there is another one, if you can, uh, there is one that's made, uh, you can see that it's made in the USA and there is a telephone number for it actually. Uh, one of the biggest problems is the continuous uh, support from the American government 
to the state of Israel with three weapons and uh, not millions but billions of dollars uh, to fund the occupation. All the Jewish people around the world should come here not only to support Israel blindly but also to see, to see the wall, to see the reality here, to see the occupation. Visit people, talk to people. You need to come to Bethlehem or like Hebron. Uh, Hebron is the best place to understand the conflict actually. To live in Palestine, and especially in Hebron, it means that you live without your basic human rights. I am as a Palestinian, I am under the Israeli military law, which means I am not allowed to practice any kind of uh, uh, general assembly. I am not allowed to protest peacefully, I am not allowed to express my opinion against uh, the occupation. I don't have any kind of freedom of uh, movement in my own city and in, in my own country. We live in the same area with Israeli uh, settlers. I am under the Israeli military law, and Israeli settlers who are living in the same area are under the Israeli civil law. Two sets of law for different people in the same area. That is completely insane. I suffer from Israeli settler violence, Israeli soldiers' violence and aggression. They can arrest me whenever they want, detain me whenever they want, without any kind of accountability for the Israeli settlers or soldiers who are violating the, the international law and even the Israeli law and even violating the Jewish morals and principles. Shortly after my interview with Isa, I came face to face with the settler tour, a group of Israeli settlers being escorted through Palestinian streets by armed soldiers. Where was the Jewish moral principle of tikkun olam here? I felt angry looking at the occupying Israelis, seeing the clear asymmetry in power as they marched down the Palestinian streets. But I also felt empathy for these soldiers knowing that if my grandmother had received her visa for Palestine, it would be me out on the streets, fulfilling my mandatory army service. I don't blame the people of Israel at all. In the contrary, when I let me say address my pain, I know that they should know what I'm talking about. Because they suffered. They know what it means to be a refugee. They know what it means to be without any rights, or to be stateless, to be checked in the streets, to be, you know, completely and violently attacked, they know. So when I talk to them, I want them to understand I'm suffering now as a Palestinian from what they suffered in the past. All the Jews in the world should come and see the real truth of Israel. Is it what they want? Is it what they support? I am not equal with you now. That is a part of Judaism, it's completely not. In birthright, you don't see that. So since birthright, I have come to Ramallah, which is where we are now, um, which is in Palestine, the West Bank. I'm here to just spend time on the other side of the wall um, and to get another narrative, the, the other side of the coin, so to speak. The story that I get and the things that I hear over here are starkly different than what I get from birthright. Um, which is as to be expected. Sparsing out between the two of those is like something that I'm trying to figure out because it is a very complicated mess of things. But certainly there are different things that come into my vision and awareness just being in Palestine that I would never hear in Israel um, or that birthright would look to skirt around so that you don't know these facts. I've been here for almost two weeks 
and I'm certainly comfortable saying and having it be documented that I'm more pro-Palestinian and like a Palestinian empathizer than I am a supporter of Israel. Um, but that being said, I think that I'm still caught up in a very like activist mindset where I want to be a Palestinian supporter. But it's heartbreaking and I think terribly wrong and unjust to suppress an entire group of people and have their movements and rights and natural freedoms completely restricted and constrained um, so that they can't go see family or go to a different country or do so many simple things. The birthright movement thing is really funny to me and ironic because uh, most of my cousins are Palestinian and maybe 90% of my cousins cannot enter Palestine. If you're Palestinian, you're mostly a refugee. You're lucky if you can enter Palestine and live here. I was born in Jerusalem, so to me, my birthright is for me to be able to enter Jerusalem. But for somebody who's American, his, uh, their parents are American, like they've never even came close to the Middle East. It, that's their birthright, that doesn't make sense. As an American and as a Jew, you have a very important role. We want you to be our messenger, go around, see what is happening here in Palestine, understand the truth, take it back home, and inform the American people, especially the Jewish Americans, about what is happening here. I believe too that the change will come from the Jews outside Palestine and Israel. When the diaspora Jews come and tell them Israel must be accountable for the human rights violations, violence must not be justified from anyone. And occupation is violence. Discrimination is violence. Apartheid is violence. So let's live in peace and live in equality and live in justice all together. Do you feel it's important for me to have a sense of Jewish identity? Well, um, at this point, it is your decision. You're an adult now. Whether you want to accept that heritage or not, and which part of it you accept and which part you don't. And I think everybody in any culture or nationality has those choices to make. My month in Zion was coming to a close. It was my last night in Israel before my flight home to the diaspora. It was a rainy night in Jerusalem. Unbelievably, my time in Israel and the West Bank had made me feel closer to my Jewish identity. I had always believed that holding on to ethnic and religious roots was holding humanity back from understanding what we all share in common and where we're all going together. But after my experience in this strange land, I felt it was important to hold on to certain parts of my heritage. You're young, and as you grow, remember that it's your responsibility to assure the future of the Jewish people. It's your home, it's as much as it's mine. I am not equal with you now. That is a part of Judaism. Tattoos are forbidden according to Orthodox Jewish law. In this way, I was actively choosing to reject aspects of Judaism which no longer seemed relevant in the modern world, as I marked the phrase Tikkun Olam on my arm, in the same location as my Bubi's tattoo from Auschwitz. To me, this Jewish moral principle was something I could take forward to enable me to connect not only with those like me, but those who I had been taught to think of as other. The tattoo was a reminder to carry on the legacy of my family and my people, but more than that, it was a reminder to be on the right side of history, fighting for all people being dehumanized in our precarious world. For the indigenous peoples of my home country of the United States, 
continually resisting colonization, for Uyghurs being detained and stripped of their rights in China, and for Palestinians living under military occupation in the West Bank of Palestine. <laughs>